welcome to everybody. Glad that you could join us today. And uh, I hope you're all happy PMI rope users and you are worn them out so much you're ready to know all about how to inspect them and retire them. So without further ado, I'll move on along with the uh, first slide. And the point of this whole talk is to assume that all of you have already made the correct choice and you know what rope you wanted. Um, there's a whole nother easily 45 minute talk I could give on just how to select a rope and we can do that one someday but um, I'm hoping at this point all of you are rope owners and, and have made the right choice for the appropriate rope and you're happy with that and you just want to know what to do next. So that's what this is uh, all about. I know this is uh, probably a, a pretty crazy concept for most of us out there, but uh, the first thing I strongly suggest is people to, to read the instructions. There's a, a good bit of effort gone into writing our instructions, and um, I know that you need a magnifying glass maybe to read all of it, but there's a lot out there that of information in that little rope booklet that comes with the rope, and I strongly suggest that you um, read them and prepare to them and store them. Um, for future reference. Uh, assuming you've gotten the box open and you've uh, inspected the rope for obvious things which you should do when you open a box, um, like look for where the forklift forks smashed through the box or where somebody spilled something on the box while it was in transit. Uh, it went in clean and nice when we shipped it to you, but we have uh, no way of knowing what happened once it leaves our door, so it's kind of up to the user to take a look at that. and make sure that it still looks nice and neat and clean. We actually have had spools with uh, forks driven to them from forklifts and stuff like that. And uh, you need to be careful to inspect it for visually when you first open it. The next thing is to grab a, a broom handles, what I use, or a pole of some kind, a piece of pipe, and put it between a couple of chairs and spin the rope by, or unroll the, the spool, uh, getting the rope off of it in the lateral face. If you take it off the end of the spool by standing the spool up on its end, you will find that you have a kinky rope for a long time and you'll have to go through some tricks to do it. And once you get those kind of kinks in a rope, the the best thing to do is go find something really long and tall that you can hang it out on and, and let the rope actually hang in an unkink. So before you do that, take the advice, unroll it off the spool. Paperwork. Everybody loves paperwork. Um, there's a bunch that comes with the rope. This is a little dated slide from what the NFPA stuff used to be, but it's still the same thing. You, you've got a rope history card. You've got your instructions. You've got some login to do and uh, keep track of, and those are all important things. Uh, we provide this w uh, with the ropes when we sell them. Um, I hope all of you are making use of, of those things in your departments or however you use the rope now um, because uh, it's really the best way of knowing a lot about your rope and as time goes by as to have hung on to all this information. Key to that is a rope inspection log. It's well worth keeping it, um, especially if there's more than one person uh, using the rope and uh, that's true of most of them. If you're a if you're a caver and it's your rope and you've been on every trip and you're the only one who's ever climbed on it, it's probably a lot different than a, someone in a fire service who's got shift work and who knows what the guys did the night before. You know, did they tow somebody's car out of the um, snow bank with it or, or what? And uh, having a rope log and people knowing that every time they touch that rope, even to inspect it, they ought to be logging it in um, is helpful. And for sure, that's one thing you should do is when you first put it in service is log all this stuff down, um, where you got it, when you got it, when you put it in service, who, who had it first, and then start logging the, the actual inspections as you do them, if you do them annually or, or once a month or whatever. Whenever you take it all the way out of the bag and, and look at from end to end and check it, you should be writing down the inspection. And we'll talk about that actual procedure of how to inspect later. But here's the first thing you ought to do when you get to unpack a new rope 
after you've taken that first look at it is record that you did inspect it and it looked in good shape and, and get down the purchasing information of, of what you bought. Um, every rope should come with a, either the spool or the box or the hank with the label on it. If it came from PMI, this is what the label looks like. NFPA spells out most of what's on this label now. Um, so other companies' labels might look like this or similar to that. They don't all necessarily have their UPC codes on them, but uh, most of this information is, is on the label. Uh, as, as of the 2006 edition of 1983, uh, we added this elongation information that you'll see in the uh, upper portion of the label there where it says elongation at 1.36 kilonewtons, which is 300 pounds. Uh, this particular rope has 1.8% and it gives you the elongation also at 600 and at 1,000. And if uh, you're not aware, if you take those numbers and plot them on a little uh, chart there, you can pretty much get an idea of the elongation curve uh, of a rope and how it's going to elongate it at different various loads. Um, give you a little bit of idea what kind of um, things are going to happen when you put various loads on your rope. It, Everybody's rope should have those, all the NFPA ropes, the sport ropes. Um, we don't do this on, but it is on the NFPA ropes. Um, and of course the date. We didn't we didn't used to have to do this. PMI's done this anyway, even though it's it's been a only recently added to the NFPA to put open dating on it. We've always had a lot number that has a, the date built into it. Um, and so we could always tell you what the lot number uh, or the actual date down to the day and, and for for your information for those of you who are, are using PMI ropes that the reason why that lot number is really important to us should, should you ever have a problem that number even tells us the person who inspected it what machine it was run on what day it was run on uh, every single rope goes out of PMI has a, that kind of lot number control on it it's very key to us ever um, running down a problem should there be one Another thing we've started to do recently, um, and it'll help you in your rope history card fill out, is to put the actual part number on the end of the rope. These um, labels shown here in this picture, the, this is an RR, which stands for rescue rope, 125, one, it's 12.5 uh, rope. It's um, available with that lot number on it. The, part number on it, it's classifications, and a UPC code, which is the product code, which will bring you back to that part number should you have a scanner and be able to scan UPC codes. Um, those are now, have been for several years now, labeled uh, on the end of the ropes. If you buy them from the factory, that will be on one end of the rope. Another marker information, if you don't have the end of the rope, and you don't really know when the rope is made and you want to know, you're willing to sacrifice a couple of feet of rope, you can actually chop the rope open and peel the sheath back a little bit, as in this picture, and you can see that there's a marker tape that runs in it, and it'll tell you the, the year and quarter of manufacture and then what standard it was built to at the time it was made. And um, in our case, it, it'll say Pigeon Mountain Industries, Lafayette, Georgia on it, and uh, Underwriters Laboratories. Um, PMI has been using an internal marker tape like this, uh, oh, I would guess for pushing 30 years now. It's only been required in NFPA standard about 20, but you should be able to go back and all but the very first ropes have this. Uh, if you have one from, um, say, the late 70s or early 80s um, that you bought from us and you're still in service, shame on you. Um, but we can actually, it, it'll have a colored thread inside it and we could probably look it up and tell you what year it was made to if you told us what color thread was in the rope. Next thing, if you've got that card all filled out and you know what you're doing is, is, is what to do with the rope itself and I think these are the, the do's and don'ts of, of how to take care of your rope. These are the things that, that all will damage a rope and every I think everybody knows these but I'm going to run through them just to be sure that we go back over this stuff. The uh, abrasion obviously is the one that most of us experience day to day when we're when we're out there using the rope, and it um, 
it can be anywhere from a, a very little abrasion to a lot of abrasion and damage damage the rope or just barely break it in. And we'll talk about that later too. Heat's another one that we we really want to try to avoid. The uh, extreme heat for sure will melt the, the rope, and uh, medium heat. I'll get into these temperatures later. Will uh, actually lessen the strength of it. Chemicals is the scariest one for me because it is possible to chemically damage a rope with something like battery acid or battery fumes, and uh, it won't be necessarily evident to the user that that's even happened, um, which is why the storing the rope uh, properly is, is so important because you just never know what might get spilled or knocked or fumed onto a rope. Ultraviolet light, a lot of people get all up about this and make a big deal out of it. I would say the average customer, this isn't really an issue. If, you're, if you rig your ropes and leave them out for years, it, it becomes an issue. But I think you'll actually find that the air that you're breathing around that ultraviolet light is probably harder on the rope than the uh, ultraviolet itself. Um, in old early days of nylon and polyester ropes, and I'm talking like right after World War One and <clears throat> into the 50s, there there was a significant difference between the nylon and polyester with ultraviolet resistance. But there are now stabilizers in the nylons that we buy for sure that that make it to have pretty much the same properties for uh, daylight application UV. Um, as polyester to our nylons, there's not there's very little difference in that, and you shouldn't store them in the light if you can help it, but it's not going to be the end of the rope. Carmanals have the added advantage of protecting the load bearing part; the light never gets to the core of the rope. So even if your outer rope is slowly fading out, it shouldn't affect the real strength of the rope. Another important thing that um, you should consider is the compatibility of the gear you're using to the rope size that you've chosen. Um, this is probably a little late at this point. If you've already bought the rope, you need to make sure that it um, works with the gear you bought and vice versa. Um, it's obviously the descenders and ascenders are all usually pretty specific to a, give, to a relatively narrow range of rope diameters, and if you've bought Five eighths inch rescue rope, and your descenders only work on a maximum of half inch or 12.5. You're going to have problems with it. Same thing with pulleys and prusik knots, and, and all of it. They all have a range that they work well with, and it's important to have chosen the correct one. You can uh, you can squeeze a rope into a pulley shiv that maybe it wasn't meant to. It's not good for the pulley shiv, and it's not good for the rope either. So those are all things that will uh, shorten the life and also you'll have uh, service problems with the rope or the system you're building. Rope handling do's and don'ts. The uh, next one we got up here is uh, edge protection. This is um, it's a photo of, of our, our new little edge protector we've come out with with SMC. It's a pretty handy device and uh, you can talk to those to our reps about that later, but it's the big important point of this whole slide is that you really need to protect uh, the rope from the sharp edges. Um, nice, long, smooth, soft, limestone edges might not really damage the rope much. Um, there are certainly caves around here in Georgia that have slots in the rocks from where the ropes have won through the limestone, but I don't suggest that as a, as a plan for your ropes, you really need to use um, edge rollers, edge protection of some form or other whenever you're uh, doing it. Another issue is uh, non-moving non ropes. Um, with a, against a moving rope and you have the, the friction issue of cutting ropes uh, just from nylon on nylon type motion. So you need to protect ropes with padding as much as possible. Temperature, so I talk about it, here you go. Um, there's a lot of ways to get different high temperature issues uh, in use. Obviously, speed repelling um, is probably the, the biggest uh, overheating issue with ropes. Uh, people who go really, really fast or, or lose control of a system, um, you, you're going to be able to uh, 
uh, iron the sheath, so to speak, melt a little bit of the, the sheath. Usually that heat doesn't ever build up enough to really affect the overall temperature of the core and lower the strength of the rope from those kind of uses, but it's still damaging the outer sheath of the rope and it's going to make it difficult for doing other things later, especially if you really burn it good or melt it good on the sheath. In storage, uh, certainly it's possible to get in some pretty high temperatures um, in you know, black cars in the Florida sun. The trunk of a black car in the Florida sun would be probably a good example of some pretty high temperatures. But even those for most of the ropes we're using um, don't exceed the, the high temperature working limit of the materials that uh, are typically in PMI ropes. Um, below here on this chart are some, some examples of um, Temperatures, polyester, um, 275, nylon, 250. These are not the melting points, but these are when you're starting to affect the strength of the yarns uh, permanently with um, equal strength afterwards. Any temperature below this, they'll regain, regain their strength just fine. And Fahrenheit uh, is the working temperature limit. They actually, for those of you who think they're <clears throat> burn proof, they're, they are kind of burn proof. They just turn to carbon at about 900 degrees, so they, they don't ever actually catch on fire um, as much as they just powder up, but they uh, still do just fall apart. And uh, so you've got a, a much higher range, but it's still a, a range that you need to worry about if you're talking about escape ropes or or something that might be in a stream fire environment. Um, it's easy to get to temperatures that even Kevlar will disappear at in a, in a flash fire situation. The storing of your ropes. Um, that's a really important thing, as I said before, about chemicals and stuff. Um, we have rope bags. They're, um, probably the easiest, fastest way to, to store a flake of rope back into a, or stuff a rope back into a bag so it'll pull out easily. Um, keeps most of the sunlight and dirt and grime of day-to-day -day storage off of the ropes. It keeps them uh, ready to go. We have all kinds of bags. Um, if you want PVC bags, there, there are some options to do that. Uh, coated cor nylon Cordura bags will certainly protect most ropes uh, in most situations. Um, if you can't bag it or you don't want to bag it, coiling for sure, you don't. You need to be able to get the rope to to come out of the coil or come out of the bag quickly. So you, you sure don't want to just pile it all in a in the corner of the compartment of the truck or something like that. Um, avoid storing your chemicals. That's um, I can't say enough about that of the of the problems we've had over the years at PMI, the um, where people have had rope failures and stuff like that, the um, majority of them have been something like battery acid or or other chemicals that have got on it and ruined the ropes. Uh, no one's ever had a a major issue, but we've had some really minor near misses with uh, chemicals getting on ropes and. And in each case, people said, well, golly, I didn't see that. Um, but yeah, maybe I did get some battery acid on that rope. Um, it does happen. Uh, clean your rope as needed. The dirty, dirty rope not only doesn't last as long, but it eats up your gear. Um, there, we'll go into how to clean it later, but there's definitely uh, it's a, an important thing before you store the rope that you clean it and dry it and, 
and uh, make sure it's in good condition. Uh, air drying it is by far the best way. Don't use heat to dry them out. Uh, nylon will absorb a little bit of water and it, and it takes longer than, than you might think to, to air dry, so let it, let it hang out and get good and dry. Uh, if you can, just in a cool place, um, doesn't need heat, but let it dry and hang dry if you can. And then store it in a cool, dark, clean place um, inside a road bag, inside your compartment of your truck or, or in your, you know, however, basement, wherever you're you want to store it. Um, try to keep it up off of concrete. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that a little bit of water in concrete can can uh, be a slight slightly acidic, and that's not good for the for the bag or the or the rope. Um, I ruined the, the tent floor one day, one year doing that in my own basement. It, it doesn't take much. Talked about edge protection. Um, it's it's certainly uh, another uh, important thing. Edge rollers match match your rope to the job. We need to once again, if if you're in a situation where uh, you need a particular uh, temperature rating or chemical rating, there's a there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's a whole other talk about how to match that up for the job if you're going to be doing rescues in a plant that has a lot of um, acids around versus a plant that's, that's the average industrial plant or if you're uh, expecting to have a, a jumper and you need a, a dynamic rope, there's all kinds of different decisions you need to make and it's a whole other talk. Um, avoid overloading for sure. That's um, easily said and sometimes it's very it's difficult to do but there's there's usually a huge margin in there the way we use these ropes versus their design strength and overloading um, without something like a a high line or someplace a big force multiplier like that it, it shouldn't be an issue to ever overload a rope um, using it for rescue now if you decide to pull that car out of the snowbank, then all bets are off. Um, it's pretty easy to start overloading ropes, doing moving things that weigh five and ten thousand pounds. Avoid stepping on rope. Uh, does it is it going to break the rope when you step on it or ruin it for stepping on it once? No. I I usually tell people this simply because it 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 a it can it can grind dirt and stuff into the rope if you're on a really nasty floor surface. Um, obviously, on a smooth, clean concrete floor, it isn't going to hurt it at all. But uh, it has to—you have to know that it's smooth, and you have to know that it's clean before you do it. So, it generally shows a disdain for others. To I think for others' lives and stuff, if you go around stomping on their life safety rope. So, just in general, we should avoid doing it. We talked about high temperatures. Um, it sh it shouldn't be a big issue for most of us. Um, they're fine in uh, most ambient conditions that, that we'll be into, but if you're in the fire service and you're using them in fire ground operations, then there are some considerations you need to think about. And then obviously if you're storing them and you live in Phoenix or, or uh, Orlando, and you need to be thinking about not storing them in the back of a black police car trunk or something like that. And then avoid moving ropes, running stationary, on top of stationary ropes or anything stationary, if you've got you know edge pro that are on tied off on um, webbing or anything, you're going to have dropping. You're going to drop edge pro. If you've got a fixed rope with a moving rope running across of it, you're going to saw through that um, fixed rope. But if none of you've ever practiced this, I, I would say take a old piece of junk rope and try cutting ropes with it. It's pretty amazing how efficient it is to to do that with a, a stationary rope and a moving rope pretty scary. Now we get to the inspection part. Um, what, what do we actually look for once we've decided that, that it's time to inspect it? We've had this rope in use for a little while and it's time to take a look at it. Let's talk about what you do. Um, I think the first thing you need to decide is, is who's going to do the inspection. Um, is it just going to be anybody? Is it going to be the, you know, the, the new guy on the team or the 
or should it be someone uh, qualified? And the answer, of course, is it's, it should be a qualified. And what makes them qualified? Well, the first thing is the, the standard uh, NFPA answer is the, it's going to be determined by the authority having jurisdiction, the AHJ. That's, um, for those of you that, that don't speak NFPA, that's, that's basically whoever has the, the say-so in the matter. Um, most fire departments is going to be, you know, the, the chief or someone is going to say these people are authorized to inspect. If, if it's uh, your team, it's going to probably be the, the president of the team or some council. If it's um, you and you own it, then it's you. Um, you are the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, I think that whoever is doing the inspections should certainly be trained in, in something to do with rope access or rescue so they appreciate that this is someone's life that they're looking at and they need to be very serious about what they're doing. They should be familiar with the rope manufacturer's instructions um, that the book we talked about. They should have read it. Um, wouldn't be bad that they'd been to a class like the one you're having right now. Um, they need to understand you know, what you're looking for and what you're not looking for. And then certainly the biggest and most important thing is if this person doesn't have the authority to pull it out of service, um, then he's probably the wrong person and not fits for the job and shouldn't be doing the inspection. And then the question is what do you do if it doesn't pass? And that, I guess, is the, the destroy the ropes part of this. And, and what does that really mean? And um, you want to make sure that it, it can't get put back into service. And however you do that, um, I think it's somewhat dependent on what works for you. You can uh, you can alter it, mark it, chop it up into little pieces. Um, you can, for only uh, three dollars a meter, you can send it back to PMI, and we'll be glad to throw it away for you. Just kidding, that's a joke. But seriously, um, we we do have a recycle program, and uh, you can send it to us, and we'll recycle it. Uh, most people don't want to do that because of the cost of freight, but we'd be glad to do it. Um, but either way, uh, you need to make sure that it really is out of service and, and it won't go back into service by accident at some point in your department or um, team or whatever. Um, once again, uh, after you've finished inspecting them, you need to do all these things. We've talked about that already. Read instructions, unpack rope with care. Um, is it really the rope you, it's supposed to be? Um, this would be the same thing with uh, taking it out for inspection today. Is uh, is this the rope that the rope card goes with? Is it, you know, is all this stuff right? Is there an ID number and does it match the card? Um, and then you need to fill out the card and restore it properly. But how to do the actual inspection uh, is what's up next here. And this is the part that takes a little bit of time, but it's not so bad if you do it. Um, Pretty regularly, you get the hang of this, and and I prefer this method, which is that you look at every inch of the rope, that you actually run it um, through your hands in this um, this bow method of shuffling the rope and constantly taking a foot or two up into a bow and looking for a continuity and a uniform diameter and, and feel, and that the bow is is uniform too, and that you're actually looking for damage, looking for discoloration looking at everything. Every PMI rope, when, it, when it's at the factory, goes out the door, it's run through somebody's hands um, as it's wound. And we think you should do that over and over again as you do that. And look at, look at every inch of the rope. Um, every time you deploy it, every time you derig it would be great. Um, if not, if you can't do that every time, then you should certainly should do it pretty on a regular basis. Um, as I said, you're looking for discoloration of fibers, uh, any kind of indication of a chemical damage. Uh, you can smell ropes. Sometimes you'll smell things on them, chemical damage um, or contamination. You can smell gasoline. Gasoline itself doesn't necessarily hurt the rope, but some of the additives in gasoline might. And my, my suggestion is if you've soaked one in gasoline for a long time, that um, you should probably pull it even though it might not, um, the gasoline itself may not hurt the rope, it, um, no telling what has happened and it's not, it's just not worth it. You want to be looking for abrasion, cuts, nicks, um, 
any kind of visible difference in the rope itself. Uh, I think um, you guys get the, the concept that you just basically are looking for anything that doesn't look like a new rope. Here's, a, here's an example of the uh, bend in the rope after uh, the core is broken. This is an actual, it's the same rope you saw on the last slide. It's actually been pulled on a pull tester until the core snapped. Um, you can see that the sheath still looks kind of good, but it's really obvious it's got that hourglass look and it's got this big kink in it. And it's actually hard right there in the spot where it's come the heat from the from where the core broke. It's uh, it will never ever uh, surprise you at that point. You'll see it every time if you've got a total core failure inside a rope like this. It's um, it's very obvious. The um, so that's um, another thing you should quite quickly write down, and then I would take that rope out of service instantly should you see that. Here's a, a close-up of a for real hand inspection that's, uh, that, that, that um, loop is maybe a little smaller for the picture than it, than it has to be. You can do it, but if you can take the time to do a small loop like that, you're going to get a better inspection. The smaller the loop and the more you look at it, the, the better you're going to do it. So when do you inspect the rope? Um, after every use, for sure. Um, maybe not the second you coil it up, but before you put it back in service, um, it definitely needs to be um, inspected. After every time you clean it, uh, you're going to take it out and you're going to drag it around some places. You're going to dry it and you're going to hang it somewhere. So for sure, as you're as you're putting it back in the bag, you should be running that visual inspection as you go. If you don't use it at all, I still think you should regularly inspect it. Um, take it off the truck, take it out, uh, uncoil it or unbag it and run it from end to end. Who knows? Uh, did somebody use it and not log a problem? Did some Has some animal built a nest in the bag? Uh, all kinds of strange things can happen and if this is going to be a life safety thing that you're going to pull out really quick and use and or even if you don't need to pull it out really quickly and use, you're going to be really mad if you hike to the top of some mountain or or gone, gone deep in some cave and, and find that uh, somebody's chewed through half of your rope uh, as you're getting ready to drop it into a, your next rappel. Um, anytime you've got the time to check it before use, um, like a training operation, that's uh, I would definitely do a visual inspection at that time. And if you get a chance before emergency use, uh, it never hurts to even inspect it as you're, as you're rigging it. Even if it's just running through somebody's hands as they lower it off a, a cliff or down a pit or whatever, just to actually run it through their hands and make sure there's nothing weird feeling about it. You can do that, that part just by lowering the rope quickly. Here's an example of an hourglass rope. The, uh, this is a, another rope that we pulled, and uh, it's a good close-up of what the when people talk about an hourglass effect of a rope. This is what what we mean. It's it's very obvious. Um, it, you will see some little bumps sometimes in ropes from tying a knot or something, and under load it was pulled, and those usually will come quickly out. I just massage the sheath a little bit. This will not come out. You can massage your sheath all day, and this isn't this isn't going to go away because the core has definitely been compromised inside here, and there's there's no doubt about this. This is this is not a bump. This is purely damaged rope right here in this picture. And this is a seven sixteenth easy bend PMI rope. If uh, give you an example of that. Fuzzy rope. I don't know if you guys think that's fuzzy enough or not. Um, everybody's got their definition of what fuzzy is. I'd, I'd say that's pretty fuzzy. And uh, it's probably time to be thinking of uh, retiring that. The, our suggestion is that if you look at the individual picks on the rope, the little squares or the little diamonds, of the, those are picks. And if you look at those picks, the 
the picks um, have you know a yarn thickness themselves. Those are the sheath fibers, and if you know 50% of one of those is worn through, uh, it's probably time to replace it. If it's just a few on the on the front or the top surface of it, then it's fine. Just keep uh, keep on using it. But this is uh, probably beyond uh, that that uh, point at the point where there's and notice that it's not consistent. It's badly worn in a couple of sides of the rope and other sides aren't. This is indicative of something slid uh, and the rope was running flat and you know, across something really sharp and it just kind of chewed it up. Um, so here's two two really good examples. The, the lower rope to me it's got just what I call the peach fudge fuzz effect. It um, has just a few broken fibers and actually those few broken fibers are no, no longer under tension and they, they'll probably stay like that and be a good protective coating on the rope. The one on the top, it, it's starting to get beat up pretty bad and it's time to uh, re replace it uh, just from the, the length and the amount of yarns that are uh, broken through now. So when do you actually retire the rope? I think this is what most people always want to know is when, when should I retire my rope? Um, and unfortunately, if you're coming for a, a black and white answer, you're not going to get it. So you can just drop out now if you want. But uh, I'm going to come close to a black and white answer, hopefully for you. Um, if you suspect the rope strength has been compromised during use, and that's basically anything that uh, might have happened to it, where you severely overloaded it or, or it it got a really big shock load, or uh, you did you did pull a truck out of the snowbank with it, or anything like that, where you really think you you may have gone beyond what's this a reasonable working load on the rope and done something to it or cut it or damaged it. Once again, the abrasion thing we talked about more than half the thickness of the sheath with the arms are broken. That's that's time to retire the rope for sure. Um, if it's been controlled uh, or it's been subjected to uncontrolled or excessive loading. Um, something really big fell on it and it caught it. Um, but you don't really know what the load was and, and uh, you think it was a big one, then for sure uh, you should think about uh, retiring it. And the, and the less sure you are about how, how small the load really was and can't do the math or figure it out, um, and you think it was you know, a major chunk of the strength of the rope and it, it really needs to be pulled out of service. Most of those things are things you can see happen or see happen or see on the rope when you inspect it. And if you've seen those things happen or know that they've happened or some reports that they've happened or you can see them on the rope, then you definitely want to retire the rope. Um, the rope's been exposed, exposed to fumes or actual contact with chemicals. Um, sometimes you can't see that, but if you know that that's happened for sure, that's an instant, you know, pull it. It's just not worth it. Um, now you're going to ask me what chemicals and people are going to write me in with a million different chemicals and say, you know, what happens if it's this or that and, and the problem is that I don't, I don't know all of them. The, most of the stuff that we have reports on are individual chemicals. Most people get things on their ropes that are mixes of individual chemicals and how those things react are really tough. I can, I can tell you what household bleach does, but I can't tell you what 409 does because I don't know all the ingredients in 409 and household bleach is pretty much one solution and 409 is a bunch of solutions. I happen to know that 409 doesn't hurt nylon, at least one of the multi, um, I think there's like 40 different mixes of four, formula 409, but the, that it doesn't seem to hurt it from the testing that we've done, but it happens to be one of the few things that we've seen testing on. There are lots of other chemicals out there that, that we really don't know. Roofing tar gets on ropes a lot, and people say, you know, well, roofing tar hurt my rope. Well, the answer is, if it's petroleum tar, and that's all it is, and no. But I don't know that there are any roofing tar still used in America that don't have all kinds of other things, and they may not have even started off as a petroleum product. There are all kinds of chemicals in there, and, and I can't tell you what they are or aren't. So. Um, if it's just on the outside of the sheath and it's not something that soaks in, it's not such a bad deal. And uh, 
I don't think you'll hurt it if it's um, if it's soaked through the rope. Then for sure you want to you want to really think about or you not think about. You definitely want to take it out. So something like uh, a splash of gasoline as you were doing something like you know you know a teaspoon of gasoline spilled out of your stove on a camping expedition and it fell on the rope and you quickly you know wiped it off and it did soak into the rope would be really different than a five gallon can of gas in the compartment of a truck leaked and soaked into the bottom of uh, the bottom two thirds of a rope that was coiled up in the bottom thing and it sat in it for you know three hours and completely soaked through the rope so there, there is some difference in what exposed means but uh, I think the worse the chemical is, the, the less you need to worry about it and just retire it. Obviously, um, battery acid from charging batteries and battery acid that falls on it, either one, the fumes or the liquid, are really bad for most ropes. To me, the, the, the second bullet point here is probably one of the best ones, and that's just when you have loss, loss of faith in the condition of the rope. If, if, you're, if you're having... If you're even thinking about retiring it, then the chances are you probably should. That means you're, there's a reason in your head that you oughtn't to do it. And if you're going to argue over a couple hundred bucks, it's going to be somebody's life um, on the line. I, I would say that you know, you've got your parameters wrong for what you're doing. So anytime you're not sure the rope, you know, the rope history hasn't been logged for a couple of years, you don't really know what's been going on with the rope, or you don't know what happened with it last night, um, I would just retire the rope. Obviously if you see a, a true reduction of diameter like we were talking about, the, the hourglassing and stuff like that, for sure it, it's a take it out of service immediately. And then we get to the age question and this is the one that could go on for a nice debate for a couple hours probably. And that's <clears throat> when is a rope too old? Um, we, we try not to sell you a rope that's more than two years old. Most of them are only a few weeks old, but we, we pull them off the shelves here when they're two years from the day they're made. Um, and that's simply because to, we want you to have a few more years of shelf life for the rope, no matter what. Um, I would like to tell people that um, the five to ten year range is where you ought to be thinking about replacing it just strictly based on age. The, at 10 years, um, even if it's been well, well cared for, it's probably time to be taking care of, taking it off. And if it's been used, for sure, it should be coming out of service. There's some there's some old studies that, that people took in-service ropes, and the average was like 2% degradation of strength uh, per year. So if you follow that and you you've loved this rope and taking good care of it, but if you've used it a lot in 10 years, it's it's going to be at least, you know, 20 percent from the original breaking strength of it. And um, at the, or I won't say at least, that's probably the, the average answer to it. If you've kept it hermetically sealed, if you really have a way to hermetically seal your ropes and store them, um, the shelf life is pretty indefinite. Most of us have no way to hermetically seal our ropes and keep them uh, you know, out of the even the air we breathe, and, and that is a, an issue. Is that uh, some of the worst stuff around is just out there constantly, um, and you know, in the traffic that we're driving our trucks through and we're living our lives in. Um, and I don't know what your your air is like, and I can't really tell you when to do it. But um, I tell people to budget for five years and be happy if they can afford it uh, and get the money approved in the seven to ten years and and over 10 for sure they need to be replaced. Um, that's my best guess. If in doubt, throw it out. I don't know what else to say about that. That's certainly the best advice uh, of when to, when to toss it. If you're having a discussion, it's time to go. Let's talk briefly about um, cleaning the ropes. Um, assuming you've inspected it and decided it's in good shape, you should probably clean it before you inspect it, but um, either way, here's um, the first thing again is read the directions, see what it says. Um, it, our, you know, if it says dry clean and dry clean, we don't have any ropes that you should dry clean, I mean, but read what the manufacturer says. Our suggestion is cold water, a mild soap, we have PMI rope soap which works really great 
and it's it's not a detergent. Um, the detergents cut the oils out of ropes, and there are some um, oils that are in the yarn normally from the process of from the twisting and the winding processes that, and the manufacturing processes. And those yarns actually help keep the ropes flexible. And the, the more you clean it with hot water and detergents, the less flexible the rope's going to be just from removing all those little oils that are in there. Um, it's kind of like taking care of your skin. Uh, air dry, not in the sun, find a shady spot, hang it inside a building, whatever, uh, air dry, and once again, record it uh, in your rope log. Uh, these commercial rope washers like the PMI uh, rope washer, those of you who've never seen it, it goes on the end of a hose, it's got a piece of uh, uh, AstroTurf like material on the inside that scrubs the rope and the water runs in one end and out the other and it's really great especially if you've got a muddy gritty rope that it washes the, the uh, rope really nicely and scrubs it clean and, and I strongly suggest that everybody have one of these um, if you if you run into very dirty ropes very often this is it's a lot better you can you can take a rope to one of these commercial um, you know car wash type things with the blasting wand and it 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 blasts the mud and dirt off the rope, but it also probably blasts a little bit of it inside the rope, and that's not a good thing. It's better to have a brush on the outside and some water to wash it off the brush, like this system works. And in conclusion, um, using the right rope uh, and taking care of it and inspecting it um, is really the, the best way to extend the life of your rope, and it's going to keep you out of trouble. Um, I think you'll avoid a lot of problems by uh, always inspecting your rope and keeping it in good shape. And it's uh, kind of the end of, of my talk, and I'm going to turn it back over here to Jessica if I can find the right button. And uh, there you go, Jessica. It's yours. <laughs>